Now the whole world had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Some modern scholars have associated the Tower of Babel with known structures, notably the Edomenaki, a ziggurat dedicated to the Mesopotamian god Marduk in Babylon. The Sumerian tale called Enmikur and the Lord of Arata explains how Enmikur of Uruk is building a massive ziggurat in Eridu and demands a tribute of precious materials from Arata for its construction. At one point, Enmikur recites an incantation imploring the god Enki to restore the linguistic unity of the inhabited regions so that they may all address Enlil together in a single language. Of course, like many biblical accounts, the Tower of Babel story is actually a rendition of a much older Anunnaki story. For regular viewers of this channel, you already know that when the names Marduk or Enki are invoked, then the so-called myth in question is more likely an actual historical account involving our ancient astronaut ancestors. And once we find ourselves in this subject matter landscape, there is no better guide than Zachariah Sitchin, the foremost authority on all things Anunnaki. In chapter 2 of his book, The End of Days, Sitchin explains how the tale of the Tower of Babel is, in reality, the history of how Marduk attempted to assert his supremacy by establishing his own city in the heart of Enlilite territories. His ambition was to build his own space facility and its own launch tower in Babylon, but the story is much deeper than Marduk's attempt to build a space facility. Quote, the biblical tale is remarkable in many ways. It records, first of all, the settlement of the Tigris-Euphrates plain after the deluge, after the soil had dried up enough to permit resettlement. It correctly names the new land Shinar, the Hebrew name for Sumer. It provides the important clue from where the settlers had come. It recognizes that it was there that man's first urban civilization began, the building of cities. It correctly notes and explains that in that land, where the soil consisted of layers of dried mud and there was no native rock, the people used mud bricks for building and by hardening the bricks in kilns could use them instead of stone. It also refers to the use of bitumen as mortar in construction. An astounding bit of information since bitumen, a natural petroleum product, seeped up from the ground in southern Mesopotamia but was totally absent in the land of Israel. The authors of this chapter in Genesis were thus well informed regarding the origins and key innovations of the Sumerian civilization. They also recognized the significance of the Tower of Babel incident. As in the tales of the creation of Adam and of the Deluge, they melded the various Sumerian deities into plural Elohim or into an all-encompassing and supreme Yahweh but they left in the tale the fact that it took a group of deities to say, let us come down and put an end to this rogue effort. Sumerian and later Babylonian records attest to the veracity of the Bible tale and contain many more details, linking the incident to the overall strained relationships between the gods that caused the outbreak of two pyramid wars after the deluge. The Archive has an entire video pertaining to the Pyramid Wars, and if you have not had a chance to watch that, a link is provided in the description. Sitchin explains that the peace accords between Enlil and Enki circa 8650 BC 
left the Eden under Enlil-like control. This was acceptable for Anu, Enlil, and even Enki, but never agreed to by Marduk. When territories in the Eden began to be allocated to the gods, Marduk raised the question, What about me? Quote, Although Sumer was the heartland of the Enlil-like territories and its cities were Enlil-like cult centers, there was one exception. In the south of Sumer, at the edge of the marshlands, there was Eridu. It was rebuilt after the Deluge at the exact site where Enki's first settlement on Earth had been. It was Anu's insistence when the Earth was divided among the rival Anunnaki clans that Enki forever retain Eridu as his own. Circa 3460 BC, Marduk decided that he could extend his father's privilege to also having his own foothold in the Enlilite heartland. Marduk's new base was situated between the rebuilt Nipper, which had been the pre-diluvial mission control center, and the rebuilt Sippar, which had been the pre-diluvial spaceport of the Anunnaki. The name Marduk gave the place was Babili, in Akkadian which meant gateway of the gods, a place from which the gods could ascend and descend where the appropriate main facility was to be a tower whose head shall reach the heavens. In other words, a spacecraft launch tower. As in the biblical tale, so it is told in earlier Mesopotamian versions that this attempt to establish a rogue space facility came to naught. The Mesopotamian texts make it clear that Marduk's act incensed Enlil, who in his anger a command poured out for a nighttime attack to destroy the tower. Sitchin reveals that Egyptian records report that a chaotic period that lasted 350 years preceded the start of the pharaonic kingship in Egypt circa 3110 BC. It is this time frame that indicates the date of the Tower of Babel incident to circa 3460 BC, because it marked the return of Marduk to Egypt, the expulsion of Thoth, and the start of worship of Ra. Failing in his first attempt, Marduk never gave up his attempts to dominate the official space facilities that served as the link between Nibiru and Earth, or to establish his own facility. So why did Marduk ultimately fail in his first attempt? Well, as Sitchin explains, it was a matter of timing. Quote, a well-known text recorded a conversation between Marduk and his father Enki in which a disheartened Marduk asked his father what he had failed to learn. What he had failed to do was to take into account the fact that the time then, the celestial time, was the age of the bull, the age of Enlil. Among the thousands of inscribed tablets discovered in the ancient Near East, quite a number provided information regarding the month associated with a particular deity. In a complex calendar begun in Nippur in 3760 BC, the first month, Nisanyu, was the Izin, or festival time for Anu and Enlil. The list of honorees changed as time went by, as did the composition of the memberships of the Supreme Pantheon of Twelve. The month associations also changed locally, not only in various lands, but sometimes to recognize the city god. We know, for example, that the planet we call Venus was initially associated with Ninma and later on with Inanna slash Ishtar. Though such changes make it difficult for the identifications of who was linked celestially to what, some zodiacal associations can be clearly inferred from text or drawings. Enki clearly associated with the water bearer Aquarius, and also with Pisces. The constellation that was named the Twins, Gemini, without doubt was so named in honor of the only divine twins born on Earth, Nanar slash Sin's children, Yutu slash Shamash, and Inanna slash Ishtar. The feminine constellation of Virgo, like the planet Venus, was probably named at first in honor of Nimma but it was renamed Absin, meaning whose father is Sin, which could be correct only for Inanna slash Ishtar. The archer or defender, Sagittarius, matched the numerous texts in hymns extolling Ninurta as the divine archer, his father's warrior and defender. Sippar, the city of Yutu slash Shamash, no longer the site of a spaceport after the deluge, was considered in Sumerian times to be the center of law and justice, 
and the god was deemed as the chief justice of the land. It is certain that the scales of justice, Libra, represented his constellation. And then there were the nicknames comparing the prowess, strength, or characteristics of a god with an animal held in awe. Enlil's animal, as text after text reiterated, was the bull. It was deciphered on cylinder seals, on tablets dealing with astronomy, and in art. Some of the most beautiful art objects discovered in the royal tombs of Ur were bull heads sculpted in bronze, silver, and gold adorned with semi-precious stones. Without doubt, the constellation of the bull, Taurus, honored and symbolized Enlil. Its name, Udana, meant the bull of heaven. And texts dealing with an actual bull of heaven linked Enlil and his constellation to one of the most unique places on earth. It was called the landing place. And it is there that one of the most amazing structures on earth, including a stone tower that reaches to the heavens, still stands. Sitchin explains that many texts from antiquity, including the Hebrew Bible, describe or refer to unique forest of tall and great cedar trees in Lebanon. In ancient times, it extended for miles, surrounding the unique place, a vast stone platform built by the gods as their first space-related site on Earth before their centers and real spaceport were established. It was Sumerian texts attested the only structure that had survived the deluge and could thus serve right after the deluge as a base of operations for the Anunnaki. From it, they revived the ravished lands with crops and domesticated animals. The place called the Landing Place in the Epic of Gilgamesh was that king's destination in his search for immortality. It was also there that Enlil kept the Gudana, the Bull of Heaven, the symbol of Enlil's age of the bull. The journey to the Cedar Forest and its landing place began in Uruk, the city that Anu granted as a present to his great-granddaughter Inanna. Its king early in the 3rd millennium BC was Gilgamesh. He was no ordinary man, for his mother was the goddess Ninsun, a member of Enlil's family. That made Gilgamesh not a mere demigod, but one who was two-thirds divine. As he got older and began to contemplate matters of life and death, it occurred to him that being two-thirds divine ought to make a difference. His mother agreed with him, but explained to him that the apparent immortality of the gods was in reality longevity due to the long orbital period of their planet. To attain such longevity, he had to join the gods on Nibiru, and to do that, he had to go to the place where the rocket ships ascend and descend. Though warned of the journey's hazards, Gilgamesh was determined to go. At his mother's insistence, an artificial double, Enkidu, which meant, by Enki maid, was to be his companion and guardian. There were, in fact, not one, but two journeys. One was to the landing place in the Cedar Forest, the other the spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula, where, according to Egyptian depictions, rocket ships were emplaced in underground silos. In the first journey circa 2860 BC to the Cedar Forest in Lebanon, the duo were assisted by the god Shamash, the godfather of Gilgamesh, and the going was relatively quick and easy. As they reached the forest, they witnessed during the night the launching of a rocket ship. This is how Gilgamesh described it. The vision that I saw was wholly awesome. The heavens shrieked, the earth boomed, Though daylight was dawning, darkness came. Lightning flashed, a flame shot up. The clouds swelled, it rained death. Then the glow vanished, the fire went out, and all that had fallen was turned to ashes. Awed but undeterred, the next day Gilgamesh and Enkidu discovered the secret entrance that had been used by the Anunnaki but as soon as they entered it, they were attacked by a robot-like guardian who was armed with death beams and a revolving fire. They managed to destroy the monster and relax by a brook, thinking that their way in was clear. But when they ventured deeper into the cedar forest, a new challenger appeared, the Bull of Heaven. 
Sitchin informs us that, quote, unfortunately, the sixth tablet of the epic is too damaged for the lines describing the creature and the battle with it to be completely legible. The legible portions do make it clear that the two comrades ran for their lives, pursued by the Bull of Heaven all the way back to Uruk. It was there that Enkidu managed to slay it. The text becomes legible where the boastful Gilgamesh, who cut off the bull's thigh, called the craftsmen, the armorers, the artisans of Uruk to admire the bull's horns. The text suggests they were artificially made. Until another tablet with the illegible lines is discovered, we shall not know for sure whether Enlil's celestial symbol in the Cedar Forest was a specially selected living bull decorated and embellished with gold and precious stones, or a robotic creature, an artificial monster. What we do know for certain is that upon its slaying, Ishtar in her abode set up a well, all the way to Anu in the heavens. The matter was so serious that Anu, Enlil, Inki, and Shamash formed a divine council to judge the comrades. Only Enkidu ended up being punished and to consider the slaying's consequences. The ambitious Inanna slash Ishtar had indeed reason to raise a well. The invincibility of Enlil's age had been pierced, and the age itself was symbolically shortened by the cutting off of the bull's thigh. We know from Egyptian sources, including pictorial depictions in astronomical papyri, that the slaying's symbolism was not lost on Marduk. It was taken to mean that in the heavens too, the age of Enlil had been cut short. Marduk's attempt to establish an alternative space facility was not taken lightly by the Enlilites. The evidence suggests that Enlil and Ninurta were preoccupied with establishing their own alternative space facility on the other side of the Earth in the Americas near the post-alluvial sources of gold. This absence, together with the Bull of Heaven incident, ushered in a period of instability and confusion in their Mesopotamian heartland, subjecting it to incursions from neighboring lands. People called Gutians, then the Elamites came from the east. Semitic-speaking peoples came from the West. But while the Easterners worshipped the same Enlilite gods as the Sumerians, the Amuru Westerners were different. Along the shores of the Upper Sea, the Mediterranean, in the land of the Canaanites, the people were beholden to the Enkiite gods of Egypt. Therein lay the seeds, perhaps to this day, of holy wars undertaken in the name of God except that different peoples had different national gods. It was Anana who came up with a brilliant idea. It can be described as, if you can't fight them, invite them in. One day, as she was roaming the skies in her sky chamber, it happened circa 2360 BC, she landed in a garden next to a sleeping man who had caught her fancy. She liked the sex, and she liked the man. He was a Westerner, speaking a Semitic language. As he wrote later in his memoirs, he knew not who his father was, but knew that his mother was an Entu, or a god's priestess, who put him in a reed basket that was carried by the river's flowing waters to a garden tended by Aki, the irrigator, who raised him as a son. The possibility that the strong and handsome man could have been a god's cast-off son was enough for Inanna to recommend to the other gods that the next king of the land should be this Amuru. When they agreed, she granted him the epithet name Sharukin, a title for Sumerian kings. Not stemming from the previously recognized royal Sumerian lineages, he could not ascend the throne in any one of the olden capitals, and a brand new city was established to serve as his capital. It was called Agade, Union City. Our textbooks call this king Sargon of Akkad, and his Semitic language Akkadian. His kingdom, which added northern and northwestern provinces to ancient Sumer, was called Sumer and Akkad. Sargon lost little time in carrying out the mission for which he was selected, to bring the rebel lands under control. Hymns to Inanna, henceforth known by the Akkadian name Ishtar, 
had her tell Sargon that he would be remembered by the destruction of the rebel land, massacring its people, making its rivers run with blood. Sargon's military expeditions were recorded and glorified in his own royal annals. His achievements were summarized in the Sargon Chronicle thus, Shurukin, king of Agade, rose to the power in the era of Ishtar. He left neither rival nor opponent. He spread his terror inspiring awe in all the lands. He crossed the sea in the east. He conquered the country of the west in its full extent. The boast implies that the sacred space-related site, the landing place deep in the country of the west, was captured and held on behalf of Inanna slash Ishtar, but not without opposition. Even texts written in glorification of Sargon state that in his old age all the provinces revolted against him. Counter annals recording the events as viewed from Marduk's side reveal that Marduk led a punishing counteroffensive. On account of the sacrilege Sargon committed, the great god Marduk became enraged. From east to west he alienated the people from Sargon and punished him with an affliction of being without rest. Sargon's territorial reach, it needs to be noted, included only one of the four post-alluvial space-related sites which was the landing place in the Cedar Forest. Sargon was briefly succeeded on the throne of Sumer and Akkad by two sons, but his true successor in spirit and deed was a grandson named Naram Sin. The name meant Sin's favorite. But the annals and inscriptions concerning his reign and military campaign show that he was in fact Ishtar's favorite. Text and depictions record that Ishtar encouraged the king to seek grandeur and greatness by ceaseless conquest and destruction of her enemies, actively assisting him on the battlefields. Depictions of her, which used to show her as an enticing goddess of love, now showed her as a goddess of war bristling with weapons. It was warfare not without a plan, a plan to counter Marduk's ambitions by capturing all the space-related sites on behalf of Inanna slash Ishtar. The list of cities captured or subdued by Niram Sind indicate that he not only reached the Mediterranean Sea, assuring control of the landing place, but also turned southward to invade Egypt. Such an incursion into Inkyite domains was unprecedented, and it could only take place because Inanna slash Ishtar had formed an unholy alliance with Nergal, Marduk's brother who espoused Inanna's sister. The thrust into Egypt also required entering and crossing the neutral sacred region in the Sinai Peninsula where the spaceport was located, another breach of the Olden Peace Treaty. Boastful, Naram Sin gave himself the title King of the Four Regions. We can hear the protest of Enki. We can read texts that record Marduk's warnings. It was all more than even the Enlilite leadership could condone. A long text known as the Curse of Agade, which tells the story of the Akkadian dynasty, clearly states that its end came about after the frowning of the forehead of Enlil. And so, the word of Eker, the decision of Enlil from his temple in Nippur, was to put an end to it. The word of Eker was upon a gate, to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. Naram Sin's end came circa 2260 BC. Texts from that time report that troops from the territory in the east, called Gudium, loyal to Ninurta, were the instrument of divine wrath. Agade was never rebuilt, never resettled. That royal city, indeed, has never been found. Sitchin concludes, quote, Without doubt, it was Marduk's Tower of Babel attempt that placed the control of the space-related sites at the center of the affairs of gods and men. And that centrality dominated much, if not most, of what took place later. So, as we can see, the story of the Tower of Babel in the Bible is yet another diluted and simplified explanation for real events involving the Anunnaki. The Babel incident was much more convoluted than the Bible leads us to believe, and it was predicated on a historical timeline that went back millennia, 
well before the first word of the Bible was ever written.